thanks for being here, Representative. Thanks for having me. So there was a story in the Idaho Business Review this week that said that you have drafted a Proposition 13 style property tax limiting initiative for Idaho to use as a quote, <laughs> nuclear option oh, yeah. if the legislature doesn't act on property tax. Is that true? I have. In 1978, when they passed Prop 13 in California, we passed Prop 1. It was kind of the same principle where you limited the values and the property tax at the local government and the ability to raise your property taxes. But wasn't the, pro the California style initiative, the Proposition 13, unconstitutional in Idaho? In Idaho, there was one issue with it, and that's where you readjust it, because it had the value set where they only grew at 2% a year. So Idaho now goes every five years and readjusts. So they're supposed to come look at your property every five years and readjust the values. So what I did was the bill just said the values readjust every five years. And they could go up or they could go down. And if you know, think back to the last downturn in the economy, you know, prices cut in half, they just plummeted. So it could go either way, but it resets the clock every five years. Because you have to reset the clock to keep like properties treated the same. Right, That's. I thought that was the issue, was that the Idaho Constitution requires us mm -hmm. to tax life like property is the same. And what Prop 13 did in California was it froze property taxes for people who didn't move. Well, well everybody else's went up. Well, it froze them, but it, they grew at a couple percent a year, but it, right. it kept them locked in. So the new guy comes in higher, the old guy's lower, and then if you do something like a renovation, you got moved up. They still do that, by the way. Um, but it also limited the bu budget on the other side. So the budget growth was limited also. So you can limit the budget growth. You can limit the budgets to 1% of the value. The problem in Idaho is keeping every, is having one valued here and one valued here. But I think if you readjust the clock every five years, you can get around it. And that's what the bill does. Just sets a clock every five years. So is this an issue you think should be addressed by voter initiative? I think that the legislature should fix it. And I think that the local taxing districts, cities, counties, and others should come help us fix it. They've known it's a problem for years. There's been some of us talking about it for years saying, this got to stop, we need some help, got to stop. And they've blown us off. It's got to a point now where in some areas, not all areas, some of the rural, area, rural areas of Idaho County are doing fine. They don't have a problem. But the urban areas, the Adas, the Canyons, the Kootenays, the Bonnevilles, the Bannocks, the Twin Falls, now you've got a problem in those areas. And it's got to be addressed. But nobody wants, nobody wants to come to the table. Nobody, everybody thinks they can just blow it off and, and get around the legislature. And I'm here to tell you, if we in the legislature, in my humble opinion, don't do something within the next year or two, there'll be an initiative. It's not that hard to get an initiative on the ballot in Idaho. There have been individuals come to me offering money to get the signatures to get it on the ballot. And there's actually been many of my friends on the other side of the aisle saying, give us a clipboard because they all know it needs fixed. But, but I think that if we're not careful, we can do more harm than good. And that's my concern. I mean, I love to, to whack the budgets, but I think that some are doing it right. But I also think there's a problem and we need to get it under control. Uh, I've got good people that live in my district. I was, the other day I was with a good friend of mine. I've known her since I was a little boy. She's a widow now. They put a subdivision behind her house. She can't afford to live it anymore. Values have gone up, taxes have gone up. It's not fair, you know, and she comes to me in tears. It's gotta be fixed. And it's not just for our elderly, it's for our young families and everybody else. You and I went on a little tour last summer, I took you for a drive, and I showed you around my area, and you see what's happening there. Mm -hmm. And it's a big change. And um, Star, for example, it used to be that 75% of the value was homes, and 25% was commercial industrial. Today it's about 93% homes, and 7% industrial commercial. So when everybody talks about adjusting the homeowner's exemption or something like that, there's no one to shift it to. It shifts back to the homes because there's no one else, nowhere else for it to go. And so somehow we've got to all sit down and come up with a solution. And if we don't, then I'll support running an initiative to fix it. It's got to be fixed. So the cities and counties did come in and testify to the property tax working group over the interim. And among the ideas that they've discussed are uh, addressing the homeowner's exemption, uh, updating the circuit breaker, mm -hmm. um, property tax break, which helps the low income elderly. But neither of those ideas have been introduced this session. The only property tax bills that have been intr introduced have been yours. I'll Why go, is that? I don't, you have to ask the chairman. I've got more he won't let me introduce yet. <laughs> but go back to what I just told you. You went with me in STAR. All the new construction and all the values in homes. If you raise the homeowner's exemption, you have done nothing to solve the problem because there's no other value to shift, there's nowhere to shift it to. So it goes back to them. It goes back to their unprotected portion of their property. We all think that a homeowner's exemption is gonna save things. And think about, think about that widow lady. Okay, so we raise it 5,000. We index it and it goes up 5,000. Let's say it's indexed and it goes up 25,000. The value in her home went up four or 500,000. It doesn't do anything. And the fact that there's nowhere else to shift it, it comes back to her anyways. 
So when we look at property taxes, they're the most confusing thing ever. And everybody worries about their value, and you should, value's part of it, but the other part is the budgets. And nobody wants to talk about the budgets, because none of these taxing districts can go without another dime. You know, we got the bill out there that says, let's freeze them for a year, which we did in 1979. Let's step back and look at how to fix this. And they're having a fit like the world's gonna fall in on them. If you're telling me you can't provide the same services today that you did last year with the same budget, and remember, the property tax portion of their budgets for cities is around 20, 21%. For counties, it's 40, 45 percent. If you're telling me you can't freeze that small portion of their budget and talk about a solution, I'm telling you that maybe the wrong people are in charge of those budgets. So in addition to the one-year freeze, you've introduced legislation to set a hard cap of 3 percent on the growth of the property tax budget from year to year and no longer allow for new construction or annexation. Mm -hmm. So how does a fast-growing community like those in the Treasure Valley serve all those new residents? Remember this about fast-growing communities. You're giving them a 3% on part of their budget, but they're also getting fees. Look at the cities. They, get, they give you a ticket in the city, they're going to get 90% of the fees. They get impact fees. They get money for when they uh, give you a, a permit to build your home. There's other revenues they get. That's why the property tax portion is a smaller portion of their budgets. So I think that there's a way to do it with the growth and there's a way to make it happen and make growth pay for itself because I'm a firm believer in that. I mean, uh, I know, for example, if you build a house and you looked at all those houses that I drove you around and showed you, they're all paying an impact fee of the highway districts. They're all paying an impact fee for, uh, for uh, parks and parks, but I think maybe we need to look at one for schools and that's being talked about. But there's a lot of other issues out there besides you know, the property taxes. Their budget is much greater than that. They get money from other sources, including, by the way, 11.5% of the sales tax revenue, which is growing every year. They get more money for that every year. So the mayors of Boise, Meridian, and Nampa all came out against your yeah, bills. Yeah, I heard them whining. Did you talk to them when you developed those bills? Actually, yeah. In fact, I had some of the mayors, not all of them, not the mayor of Boise, though we've, we've talked to, not the mayor of Meridian, but I had talked to the mayor of Nampa and other mayors. Garden City, Johns came by, um, Star Eagle. I've talked to mayors. In fact, we've tried to get another meeting together before those bills were introduced. But the same problem happens with the mayors as what's happened to the counties this week. Nobody wants to move. Everybody will come in and all they can say is we need more. We need more. We can't do without. And I always remind them when the economy downturned in Idaho, how the state took about a, what, 25, 30% cut? It could be done. But nobody wants to do it because everybody's thinking we need more, 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 you know? And so nobody's been willing so far to come to the table and talk. And that's my concern. Because frankly, if it's done wrong, it's going to hurt all of us. But if something's not done, the nuclear option is going to come, and, it's good, and, and that's not necessarily good either. So somehow we got to work together to fix this. And, and there's been this propensity, and you saw that in the article. You know, there wasn't anything about solutions. It was all, we need more. And that's a problem. On another topic, a lot of this legislative session has been devoted to review of administrative rules, many <laughs> of them that have been on the books for years, and we have seen House committees voting to do away with, say, all the operating rules for the Human Rights Commission, all the regulations for aerial spraying of pesticides right after a, a really terrible incident this past farm, spring yeah. where farm workers were sprayed, um, the House Education Committee voting to do away with all content standards, all standards for teacher certification. Is this the way it should be working? I think that discussion is a good thing. And I think in the past with rules, now remember, rules have the effect of law. When, we brought, when I brought House Bill 100 last year, the governor called me in several times in his office, don't do it, don't do it. And I said, you're going to have an opportunity because we're going to do it. The House is going to do this to clean up the mess. Because there's some of those rules that were outdated and should have been there in the first place. And so I think that discussion about the rules is a good thing. Remember, rules have the effect of law. And under Iowa's current law, one body, one chairman can take a rule that the executive branch says they want, doesn't even have to be pertaining to a law that's in the in Idaho Code, and put it in his desk, shut the door, and it becomes a law of the land. I have a problem with that. I fundamentally have a problem with that. Rules have the effect of law. Rules ought to be approved by both the House and the Senate, and they ought to have discussions in committee. What we you're are, seeing this year, you're seeing that discussion. Mm -hmm. now, now, is there some things going on that may or may not be good? I don't know. But the fact that we're talking and having those discussions, I think, is a good thing. The other advantage is we can sit here, for example, the rules you mentioned. The, the executive branch can re put those in the day we walk out of here. They'll be back in force if he chooses to do that. And maybe he'll choose to find a path forward and address some of their concerns. And I don't know what their concerns were for those. I wasn't in the committee. But I so, think that the governor still has the opportunity to put those rules back in. I think he can still fix some of the problems. We're almost out of time. Oh, wow. As the, <laughs> as the session goes on this year, what issue do you think it'll be 
that hang us up at the end, that, that keeps the legislature from adjourning on its desired schedule of March 20th. Paying for Medicaid expansion. It's paid for till July 1. It's gonna cost way more than people think. Right now it's looking like it won't, but it will eventually. And we have not discussed how to, how to take care of that, how to pay for that issue, how to, you know, he, the governor's talked about savings, but we haven't realized those savings. We may, we may not, nobody knows. Nobody knows how this is gonna pan out because it's a new deal. And, and I think that ultimately that's the one that could keep us here. The, the others, I think, um, if we don't solve them, like the property tax thing, I think that in the next year or two it'll be solved at the ballot box if we don't solve it here. I think that things, you know, the old saying, it has, it's not soup yet. You hear us say that often, it's not soup yet. A lot of these aren't soup yet. And that's the one, the, the Medicaid stuff's the one, because we don't know on the waivers yet. We don't, you know, and the governor's mm -hmm. trying to expand some of it with meta, for mental health and stuff. And so there's a lot of moving parts there that, that aren't catching the attention of people yet that I think will. And if you look at the bills that are coming out, we're way behind normal. It's slow. A lot of that. Well, we're busy with all those rules. I was going to say a lot of that's the rules. <laughs> and, I've, and I've always thought we do the rules wrong. We should introduce the bills, do the rules in the midterm. And, and you know, there's nothing that says we have to have the rules done until we leave. And at the end of the session, you know, there's that lull between in the middle there. And we should, in my opinion, probably push some of those rules out and get those bills introduced earlier. And it'll make the people understand what's going on. This year, it was such a long push with the rules that the bills and legislation didn't come out till now and they're and you're seeing a big push you saw how many bills we read today or the first reading mm -hmm. tons of them and I think you'll see a ton tomorrow and probably Monday and Tuesday as everybody's trying to meet those deadlines and we're going to try to hold to that so we can be out of here March 20th. Representative Moyle thank you so much for taking the time yeah, to be fun. with us. It's fun thank you for having me appreciate it.